This episode is sponsored by all the generous people that are on the Patreon feed for the Life Shift podcast. Thank you so much for supporting the production of the show. As you may or may not know, I do everything myself so far. And so this contribution to the production costs and software costs and hardware costs and all those things are so helpful. So thank you so much for your support. If you are interested in directly supporting the Life Shift podcast, you can head to patreon.com slash the Life Shift podcast, and there you can learn more about how to support the show. So thank you so much. And here is this week's episode. When I went back to high school, they stuck me into something called in-school suspension. That's where you sit in, inside a room. You can't talk. You can't leave. They bring all your assignments to you. You eat lunch in there. You get like two bathroom breaks that are chaperoned, you know, by the, by the teacher. But as luck would have it, you can actually talk to the teacher that's in there. And the teacher in there, his name was Mr. Brady. And he was the first male role model actually took me aside. And he goes, you know, like, cause he got to know me. I was taught, I was in like his class for class in school suspension for my last senior year. And he, told me that, you know, you could do something with your life, that you're smart. And Matt, this actually like blew my mind. This is the first time that somebody took the time to tell me that, you know, you're, you're worth something that you can actually do something with your life. And I was actually blown away. Cause like I said before, I thought all men were like, like the way my stepfather was. So I was like amazed that this was going on. Like, I was like, oh my God. And like something inside me, he like planted a seed inside me. was like, maybe I can do something with my life. Today's guest is Kyle V. Robinson. From a childhood really marked by challenges at home, poor role models, and just genuine struggle, Kyle's story is definitely one of trying to prove oneself to an undeserving person, but really, truly, it's a long road of personal growth. In this conversation, we explore those pivotal moments that really defined his path, focusing on the power of self-awareness and truly the critical impact of finding positive role models, such as one teacher that he had in high school and someone he met a little later in life. Kyle opens up about the challenges that he faced, including navigating a turbulent home environment and the influence of a life-changing teacher who believed in him. This episode is not just about the trials, but also about the triumphs, as Kyle reflects on the lessons learned and the strength gained through those experiences. You hear me talk about this a lot in these episodes, about how some of these really challenging moments, when we have the opportunity and space to reflect upon them, we can see the silver linings and we can see the things that we've learned because of those challenging moments. In my opinion, this conversation with Kyle is filled with hope and inspiration, and really that enduring spirit of growth. So without further ado, here is my conversation with Kyle V. Robinson. I'm Matt Gilhooley, and this is The Life Shift, candid conversations about the pivotal moments that have changed lives forever. Hello, my friends. Welcome to the Life Shift Podcast. I am here with Kyle. Hello, Kyle. Hello, Matt. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you for wanting to be a part of the Life Shift Podcast. I never really thought, maybe even five years ago, that I would have the opportunity to talk to so many people about these pivotal moments in their lives that has really changed everything. So I'm just so honored that strangers essentially have come and want to share these conversations with me. Sure. I'm happy to uh, be here and actually share my story and uh, what changed me, how I got from where I was to where I am today. And it's uh, pretty interesting. You know, I think, I think it's so valuable because the, the life shift podcast really stems from my own personal experience of feeling very alone in my circumstances. You know, when I was a kid, my mom died in a motorcycle accident and everything at that moment, my parents were divorced, lived in different States and everything changed in my life. But It was also a time period where people weren't really talking about grief or mental health or any of those things. And I felt very alone. Like I was the only person that ever had a parent die and I didn't know how to navigate that world. And so really when I started this, I was hoping that we could have these conversations where people out there listening might hear your story, might hear someone else's story and feel a little less alone in their journey and maybe feel a little hope or inspiration that they can move through that moment and become whatever they want to be or however that may look for them. So, you know, like you said, your story has, has these, these changes and it's changed you from before and after. And it's just, I know there's someone out there listening that will hear your story and go, okay, I'm not the only one to go through something like this. So 
it's just such an honor. Right. And I think there's a couple life shifts that people go through, like some that they don't have control over and then some maybe that they do. And I don't know if you really differentiate between those. So I think some of my pivotal moments were some I didn't have any control over and obviously it shifted my life. And then as you get older, things happen. You're like, oh, I do have control and I could do something about it and move forward from there. So that's kind of the experience I had with my life. Yeah. And, and you know what? Coming into this, I was a little bit naive thinking, okay, yeah, one life shift changed everything. And it's like, no, as humans, we, we encounter a lot of things, whether, like you said, these external factors that kind of knock us off our, our, <laughs> knock us off our feet or, you know, throw us in the water or whatever that might be. And people have these internal fires, which I didn't really understand for a long period of my life because I was in this fight or flight mode for decades, you know, because I didn't process that grief. And I didn't realize that I had as much power as I do to change my life until, you know, I finally got therapy and all those things that helped. Sure. And go, oh, okay. You can have your own fire and you can have your own life shifts that you dictate. So that's a great point. I agree. And, well, and I think a little bit of that too, maybe subconsciously we're afraid to make those changes because you're scared of what's on the other side of that too and come to certain realizations. For sure. And for me, it was like, I was afraid of taking any chance because if there was a chance that I was going to fail in my eight-year-old mind that I carried with me, I thought my dad would also abandon me. Like I felt like the death of a parent feels like at that age, it feels like abandonment. And so it was always that fear cycle. Like you describe, it's like, what could happen? I don't know. Could be bad. And I don't want to do it. So I'm glad I did it, but. Sure. So when I was younger, I didn't have a, a parent die, but something I did feel alone because when I was four years old, my mother was recently divorced. And so we were, she was living as a single mom, me at four years old and my older brother at six years old and my younger sister at three years old. And one day we're just playing at my house. I'm upstairs playing around and I hear the doorbell ring. And this is something that normally doesn't happen in our house. And I got really excited. So I run downstairs to see what's going on. And as soon as I get to the bottom of the stairs, like standing before me is this six foot three tall man with like a big brown beard and bifocal glasses. And I'm just stunned, like scared, like looking at this intimidating figure. And my mom, who had answered the door, went to go get a glass of water or something like that. So it's just me and this intimidating figure. And I did what I thought any four-year-old would do. I just greeted him with like a little punch in the leg and I giggled. And what this man did was he made a fist too. And he punched little Kyle right in the stomach and I keeled over and I couldn't breathe. I, I couldn't scream out and tears are rushing down my face. And so nobody heard. So what this man did, he didn't try to comfort me and try to do anything. He just walked around me into the kitchen and I just scampered upstairs. And that was my first meeting with the man who would eventually come my stepfather, Ben, or my sister and I would later call him triple B, big, bad Ben. And that's kind of how my life, that's a big life shift that I didn't have control over. That's how my life started at four years old going on, you know, until I was like out of high school. Wow. Yeah. That really can shape someone. Sure. And so as I got older, you know, I, I don't want to get in the grisly details, but things didn't get easier for me. And there's, you know, sticks and things like that. But as I got into high school, I really started to rebel out. And also one of the big problems too, is my mom you would think, well, didn't your mom do anything about this? And like the simple answer or the easy answer was no, because she was so, she thought it was very, very important for us to have a father in our lives. Cause my biological father was out of the picture. Seemingly he, he lived in Florida and, you know, he sent checks on birthdays and Christmas, things like that, but he really wasn't in our lives. And so my mom was hell bent on getting a father for us. And she was excusing a lot of behavior, you know, thinking like boys will be boys and things like that. And as I was getting older and as I was growing up through adolescence to teenager, I thought this was love. I thought this is what a father was supposed to be. Like, I'm dead serious, man. I like, I, I didn't, I really thought that I thought all men, I thought all men's dads were like this at home. Like I didn't know any better. So, and my mom was telling me like, this is love that like, she even made us call him dad and like, you know, tell him that we loved him like crazy stuff. And like, and I thought this was completely normal growing up. I really did. But it was open. Like you got, everyone was kind of like, like it was a, you, everyone was aware that he was doing this to you guys. Well, in the close family. So like, you know, my, me and my, my brother and my sister and my mom, but like on the outside, my mom would pretend like that everything was okay. You know, everything's fine. And as a little kid, I didn't know it was wrong. Like 
I thought it was normal. Like I thought like, Hey, this guy's just a jerk. You know what I mean? I'm supposed to love him. My mom tells me I'm supposed to love him. So this is the way it is. And then as I got older, like in high school, I eventually started to rebel out a lot because I didn't know. Cause I, I thought I was the problem. I thought, you know, it was my fault. And so, and I didn't know who to turn to or what to do. So I got in fights all the time in high school. I started drinking a lot in high school and eventually I got expelled from high school for, you know, for getting in fights and not like skipping school. And so I had to repeat what my junior year over again. And again, my mom was like blaming me and I couldn't fathom because all of my friends, my friends in high school, they were only my friends. I kind of gravitated to people that were not a good influence because I didn't think I deserved better. But I couldn't understand why they weren't getting kicked out of school. I couldn't understand why they weren't getting expelled. And it was because they didn't have the same home life I had. But I still couldn't realize it. So I was just so upset at myself because I knew I was smart and I couldn't understand what was going on. And so after I got expelled, I come back again for my fifth year and I'm doing the same stuff, same things, getting into fights. And I just want all this madness to stop. And so what I decided to do in the middle of class one day, I got a test back that I failed. And I was just so mad because I knew if I would have like applied myself, I would have been able to pass. And I was like, I'm just so sick of this. I need to do something about this. So what I did was I left school in the middle of the day and I went to go turn myself into drug rehab as a 17 year old. And, and it wasn't like I was a drug addict. I obviously I had problems with, you know, alcohol. I was just using it as an excuse, but I didn't know what else to do. Like I thought this, I thought I was the problem. So how do I fix this problem? And so it's actually not really funny, but when I got there as a 17 year old, you just can't say, Hey, here I am. I can turn myself right. in. They go, you need to be court ordered or you have to have a parent or guardian turn you in. And so my mom who actually worked in the building, it was a big hospital and they had a, you know, a drug rehab wing for juveniles. And I, I knew my mom worked in there. So they, she came down and she actually signed me in and she was really relieved that I was actually doing something because she wasn't about to admit that, you know, your stepfather was the problem or, and I'm not blaming him or, I mean, he's the reasonable on why a lot of the, these things happen, but we'll get to that part when I had that realization. And so I'm in drug rehab and I actually felt safe at that moment because I'm away from him. I'm away from my like bad influence friends. And so, but because I had to go to drug rehab, I had to spend an, I missed another year of high school. So actually when I got out, I go back to high school. Now, Matt, I'm in my sixth year of high school. And this is one of the pivotal moments. Two amazing things actually happened when I went back to uh, high school. They, when I went back to high school, they stuck me into something called in-school suspension. That's where you sit in, inside a room. You can't talk. You can't leave. They bring all your assignments to you. You eat lunch in there. You get like two bathroom breaks that are chaperoned you know, by, the, by the teacher. But as luck would have it, you can actually talk to the teacher that's in there. And the teacher in there, his name was Mr. Brady. And he was the first male role model actually took me aside and he goes, you know, you know cause he got to know me. I was taught, I was in like his class for class in school suspension for my last senior year. And he told me that, you know, you could do something with your life, that you're smart. And Matt, this actually like blew my mind. This is the first time that somebody took the time to tell me that, you know, you're, you're worth something that you can actually do something with your life. And I was actually blown away. Cause like I said before, I thought all men were like, like the way my stepfather was. So I was like amazed that this was going on. Like, I was like, Oh my God. And like something inside me, he like put his, you know, planted a seed inside me. It was like, maybe I can do something with my life. Not that I really, you know, as a 17, 18 year old, I didn't really take action at that moment, but it was so nice to have somebody believe him. Like, Hey, somebody is in my corner. Like somebody's there. Was it hard for you to believe him? I knew that there was a little something inside of me, but no one's ever told me about it. So maybe I was just trying to convince myself, but it was nice to have a confirmation like, hey, you can do something with your life. You can do something. So it's really interesting, though, because growing up and absorbing that for years upon years, I can see how someone might act out. But also all along, it sounds like you still held on that thread of humanity and that like you were worth more than something. Cause I can't imagine someone that's acting out and going like really angry, I guess, kind of getting that anger out in a different way would then also have that self-awareness that you had to go, I need to like fix this. And I don't think I can do it myself and then go check, like go try to check yourself into something like that. So like, that's a, that's a big thing that I don't think is that common. I think it's just like, 
people that are in your circumstance that you were in, I almost imagine a lot of the people that I've talked to, it's kind of like you just absorb that and then you just place the blame on everything else. Nothing's your fault where it sounds like you were taking some ownership of like, I'm doing this, but I can't stop doing this. Right. So that, that in itself is like super impressive, which then led me to ask you like, I mean, I guess it makes sense why you would believe your teacher, but I think a lot of people be like, what are you talking about? Like, no, I'm a mess. Like nobody cares. My stepfather tells me every day that nobody cares. And I didn't have anybody else to go to. It's like back then I'm 46 now. So those teachers weren't like looking for like things that were going on and nobody was like saying, Hey, are you okay? Like you must be acting like this for some reason. You know, it was just like, nobody was talking about anything back then either. This is what like mid nineties, right? Exactly. Or like early mid nineties, people weren't talking about like things going on at home. People were talking about mental health stuff where, I mean, we're very similar in age. So I, same thing with me. I mean, I didn't, I got to my thirties when I realized all the things that were wrong with me. So that's kind of why I'm commending you in this sense of like at 16, 17, you had this awareness of like, something has to change. And I think it's possible. Right. But also, so, I mean, not to get too out of my, I always thought it was external things needed to change, not really change inside myself. And also I was blaming myself for it. I still thought there was something wrong with me. So I had to fix me too. And that's what I wanted to do. Like, I didn't have the insight to like look inside, okay, Kyle, who do you want to be? Or what do you want? I just wanted to change something like and stop the madness. But yeah. Th- and what I, I guess I'm trying to take credit away from that, what you're trying to give me, but yeah, there was a little something inside me that wanted something more to my life and wanted something to change and wanted to be better. You could have been a hundred percent destructive. You weren't a hundred percent destructive. I mean, maybe you were a lot percent destructive, right. but there was something in you that was like, wait, you know, and maybe it was subconscious. Maybe it was something you picked up from your mother, you know, like whatever it may be from other parties that are in your life. But yeah, I think there's something to celebrate there just in itself, because I think a lot of people that grew up in those circumstances will just ride that, unfortunately, because that's what they know. And that's how it goes. And it's just like, well, that's my life. But you were something was inching you. And then And I'm guessing that's probably what that teacher saw in you too. Like there is potential in this kid. Like he, something's wrong, but there's also potential. So let me talk to him. Right. And similar to you, I know how you had a teacher who changed your life and you reached out to her a while ago about, you know, recognizing you. I actually reached out to him a while ago too and thanked him. And he said, oh, of course I remember you. That's great. You're doing well and things like that. So it was nice to reconnect and let him know that he really changed my life a lot. And yeah, he was just teachers, being him, that like he wasn't yeah, trying, like exactly. just being him. That's what is crazy. Exactly. Teachers, I mean, they're with us for so much of our lives, you know, when we're in the school day and they see so much that maybe those of us that had this home life that might have been tough, they see us, you know, in this other space trying to trying to do other things. And same, like you said, I, I reached out to my third grade teacher. So I was eight, you know, when she met me and she was trying to like help heal this little kid who was just so very lost. And then, yeah, in my, I want to say I was in my thirties. I reached back out to her and like, she knew who I was. She remembered things from the class. And you're like, how do you do that? You've just been teaching for like 30 something years. So, I mean, there was something that must have stuck out because he also remembered you, which is it was really impactful. It was really well. great. And so after he planted that seed in me, when I wasn't hanging out in, in school suspension, they eventually left me out. And by this time, I'm, you know, ni- 18, 19 years old. I'm in my sixth year of high school. And I'm still kind of, I, I want to keep my head down because I can't get in any trouble. Like when I was a, a juvenile, you know, I got in trouble, arrested for fights and things like that. But now that I'm an adult, if I get arrested, like I'll be, go to serious jail. So, and I was deathly terrified of that. And so I'm trying to keep my head down, trying to be on the straight and narrow. But one day, I guess I was making fun of the wrong person, just having a smart mouth. And I was messing with the wrong kid outside of school one day and he wanted to fight me. And I'm trying to tell him, no, 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 I don't want to fight. You know what I mean? I'm de- A, he could probably beat me up for sure. And B, I didn't want to get in any trouble. So I'm trying to get away from him. But before I can get away from him, there's a huge crowd around us, about 150 kids. This kid is like, trying to grab at me. I'm just like running around in a circle. And before I know it, I'm grabbed out of the circle of kids and I'm arrested and I'm arrested for like assault, disorderly conduct, disturbing the peace. And now I'm going to like real jail. I'm in real trouble, even though I didn't even do anything wrong. And so my mom won't give me a lawyer because she doesn't believe that I didn't do anything wrong from my past. 
and anything like that. And so what I decided to do is I was like, I know I didn't do anything wrong. So what I'm going to do is, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to represent myself. And so what happens is we're in, and I'm fast forwarding through a lot of things, but it's fine. What happens is we're in court one day. It's just me, the prosecutor, the judge, and then the arresting officer and court starts and the prosecutor starts asking the arresting officer some questions saying, do you see the person that was involved in this altercation? And the officer points, points me out and the prosecutor asks a few more questions. And then the judge goes, Kyle, do you want to ask, you know, the officer some questions? And in my head, I'm very, very confident, but as I start speaking, I start, my mouth starts, you know, starts shaking, my voice is trembling, but I eventually get enough nerve and I start asking him some questions. I go, where were you when you first saw this alleged incident? He goes, oh, sitting in my police cruiser. And I go, well, where was that relative to where you saw this incident? He goes, oh, about 150 yards. And I go, what did you see? He goes, oh, I saw about 150 kids surrounding you guys. And I go, so you're telling me from sitting in your police cruiser from 150 yards away through like 150 kids, you saw me strike somebody else? And he goes, well, no, I can't say that for sure. And that was it. The judge just found me not guilty. Case was dismissed. I was just so happy. And what I remember at that point is that what Mr. Brady told me before is like, if you believe in yourself and if you push forward, good things will happen. And so that was a big life change for me. And I'll get to it why. But I was so, I was so happy that that happened to me. And I was, yeah. uh, I, A, because I wasn't in trouble. And A, what happens when I start believing in myself, even at that young age? On something also that like nobody is taught to do, right? I mean, we're taught to stand up for ourselves and speak up for ourselves, but not when it not when it relates to like the court and the law and all those things. I think so many of us would just like shy away and then we'd have to figure out a public defender of some sort. And here you are like, no, I'm going to do it yeah, because I know I'm in the right. And you were. I was. And but you had all these, you know, authority figures, too. And telling me that I was wrong and like, you're, you're, you know, you're in trouble. So that happened. And eventually I do graduate high school after six years with like a 1.046 GPA. I think my class rank is like 346 out of like 349, something ridiculous. And so, you know, college is not on the horizon. Nothing's on the horizon whatsoever. And so I don't know what I want to do with my life, but I want to do something you know, so, but right out of high school, I get a job at like an oil change place. And I, and between me and you, Matt, and our listeners, I know nothing about cars. And so I'm working at this oil change place. And one day I'm sitting underneath the uh, car, like changing some oil. And I think, no, I want to do something more with my life, but I wasn't sure what I can do. I was like, can a person who spends six years in high school, you know, go to college? And I was like, I wasn't sure, but I wanted to find out. And so eventually I take the ACT to get into college because obviously I didn't take it in high school because I was too busy, you know, getting in fights and doing drugs. But I take the ACT and I get and do well enough that I get into college. And so this is my opportunity. This is my chance. And so I don't want to mess this up. And so what I decided to do is I buckle down and my first semester of college, I get almost a 4.0. And like, I'm so, I was like, I knew it. And I, Fucking, I freaking knew it. And so I'm very, very happy with myself. And so, you know, my mom is pleased, you know, she put like the Dean's list thing on the refrigerator back at home. Cause I moved out right away. Cause obviously I need to get away from triple E, but also I'm doing a lot of this too, to prove to triple B I'm not a loser. You know what I mean? And I show him, you know, that I made the Dean's list. Cause my mom still wants me to call him dad. I still think, you know, he's my dad. Like, you know, he's still in my life big time. And so he doesn't care. He doesn't care at all. Not at all. So did you feel like you had to win his love or did you want to, or do you just wanted to show him that you weren't who he said you were? I think it was more a little bit of both. And as I got, when I was younger, I think I wanted him, like I wanted his love. But as I got older, I think I just wanted to show him, like, I'm not who you think I am. And so I think it kind of shifted as, as I got older. And so eventually, so after I made the Dean's List, I decided to transfer school. So I'm going to a different school and I start partying up again because I meet a whole new group of friends. And these weren't bad guys. They just weren't good for me at that time because I kind of get right back into what I was doing in high school, just partying it up. And the excuse I gave myself was like, oh, you're in college now. You're okay. You're doing okay. And so it's okay to do this. It's okay to party and things like that. And obviously, my everyone does it. Right. Exactly. And so my grades start dropping. Things aren't going so well. I'm on like academic probation. 
And then one day all my friends decide, let's go drink and do some day drinking down at the bar. So I go, okay, everyone piles in my Jeep and we drive down to the bars. And so we're doing something, you know, we're drinking, we're doing something called power hour where you take a shot every time you hear some sort of song. Come. Great idea. Yeah, yeah. Great idea. So we're down there all day and we decide, you know what, let's go home and change so we can go back out. I go, okay, let's get my Jeep. Let's go. So as we're driving home, we're taking a left onto my street. I hit the gas, boom, run into a telephone pole, total my Jeep, put everybody in the hospital. I get arrested for, you know, DUI, reckless driving. And I'm thinking to myself, it's high school all over again. This is like, you're not doing like, you're not doing great. You're not trying to do what you want to do with your life. And, and again, I'm, it's hard for me to rationalize, you know, everybody does this. I was like, no, everybody doesn't get a DUI. Everybody doesn't put, you know, everyone in the car in the hospital. Luckily they were all okay. But I was like, I was like, this is not, this is not good. Do you kind of go back to thinking, oh, triple B is, is right. Oh, all the time. That's in the back of my head. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. I was like, so it's kind of like a self-fulfilling prophecy. It was like, it doesn't matter what I do. You know what I mean? It doesn't matter. See? Yeah, Yeah. exactly. I have one win and then three more loses. Exactly. It's like, you're exactly who you think, who you say I am. Cause like, and I didn't say this for like when I was growing up in high school, he would always call me a loser, you know, all all kinds of stuff. And so it was like, yeah, it was kind of like, you know, maybe he's right, but I did, I, in my inside, I'm fighting. That was like, he's not right. You know what I mean? But these things would happen. Like, Maybe he is right. You know, maybe he is right. What is the universe telling me? Correct. Yeah. And so I eventually, you know, I have to go to some like a DUI diversion program and like the, it's dropped or I get less charged and so I don't have to, you know, go to jail or anything like that. And I eventually limp through college and I do graduate with like a 2.02 GPA, but I have nothing on the horizon because I made no contacts. I kind of just partied through college, but I have a college degree. And again, triple B, he doesn't care. You know what I mean? Like it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Cause it actually was at the time I make it, I make it sound like it wasn't that big of achievement. It actually was a big achievement that I got a college degree after six years of high school. You know what I mean? And so after what I've been through. Yeah. I mean, it's a big deal with all you're discussing. And like I said before, like people that grew up in those circumstances might not have done that, you know? So there was still something in you that was lighting you up, making you go. And so I wanted to again, so I was, I knew I started, started to realize it's about who I hung around with and who, you know, how I'm spending my time's dictating how my, how my life's going. And so after I graduated college, I decided to like run away. That is, I had an opportunity to go live in San Francisco and I took that. So I drove out to San Francisco and I worked out there. Nobody knows me there. Right. I worked out there and I, it, it was kind of good because I was away from triple B. I was away from like my old friends, but my mom would call and she would like call on my birthday. I'm like, Oh, your dad wants to talk to you. And like, so put him on. And so it, she's just driving this home all the time, all the time. And I'm still at this point where I don't think there's anything wrong. I think this, I don't enjoy doing it, but I'm still doing it. Right. But I'm out in San Francisco. I'm kind of getting things together. I'm getting my, like my finances together. I'm trying to get my life together and I'm bartending. Things are going great. And I was like, but you know what? I want to do more with my life. And I think about, you know, high school, I think about, you know, what, what can I do? And I think about that instant in, in where I represented myself. And I was like, could I actually do that in real life? Could I be a lawyer in real life? And I wasn't sure, but again, I wanted to find out. So I took the entrance exam to get into law school, the LSAT, and I did well enough to get into law school. And now I'm moving out to Michigan and I'm going to Western Michigan Law School. And so now I know I do not want to mess this up again, just similar to what I did in my first semester in college. I was like, okay, you have this opportunity, Kyle, let's not blow this opportunity. So now you're in law school. And so what I did was I found the two smartest kids that I could find and just stuck next to them all three years of high school. And it's very easy to find these kids because in law school, they're the ones who raise their hand every time the professor asks a question or anything like that. So I literally hung next to those kids all three years. And i and there was no dramatics that happened in law school because I was a very good kid because you can't mess around in law school. And in college, you kind of mess around and do well enough in law school. If you're not studying and you're not going to class every day, you're going to get, you're going to fail out. And so I made the dean's list one semester. I got the certificate of merit one semester. That's getting the highest grade in one of your classes. And I did well enough, better than I did in high school, obviously better than I did in college. And I was going to graduate law school. And, but in order to graduate law school, you have to take an internship. And so I just applied to internships in New York city. Cause that's where I always want to live. So eventually I got an internship in New York city 
And I hated every second of it. It was at this matrimonial law firm. It was a nightmare. Mm. I hated every second of it. <laughs> and I was like, I'm not sure if I want to be a practicing attorney. And so that was in the back of my head mm. too. Eventually, I did graduate law school. And again, Triple B, I was trying to prove to him that I'm not worthless. And at my high school or my law school graduation, this is what he told me that he goes, I would have lost a bet. That was his congratulations to me. And I started to come to a realization that I could find the cure for cancer and this man, it, it didn't matter. So I started to get the mentality now, you know what, forget him, you know, forget him. But again, I don't want to disappoint my mom either. Cause she thinks she wants me to, you know, calm down and things like that. So, you know, yeah. I'll text. How old are you around this time? So I graduated law school in 2009. So 46 now. So I'm around 30 years old. If, that, if I'm doing the math correctly real quick. So somewhere, <laughs> it's a trick, right? It's a math podcast somewhere around there. I get it though. I mean, the reason I ask is because like 30, we can, you know, some of us that have these traumas early on, we are still so attached to the perception of those that are deemed parents have of us. And, and I can see why that would still matter though. And, and, you know, I think some people are like, why? Well, you're 30. You're like, what? But when you have those early things, it's, it sticks around and it probably still does. Even if you've worked through things, you still think of it and you're like, well, for sure. Maybe well, don't act on it spoiler alert, Matt, my mom is still married to this man to this day, which is insane. And so, yeah, it, which is, it, but she comes from a different generation correct. too. It's, and that generation has, there's different things that we work through. And like, even our generation, we're just now pushing through things that our generation is not wasn't used to and we didn't grow up with because we're like, oh, there is something we can do with ourselves. There is something that can be better. We don't have to accept everything. And so, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt no, your story. No, just yeah. Curious, because I think that at 30, people that haven't experienced something like this, maybe they've had a, a more casual of lives moving forward. They're like, yeah, 30, I was already out here doing all these things and never even called my parents or never even talked to my parents, never even thought of them, you know, whatever it may be. And so, I think it's interesting to me because I was very similar. I was into my thirties when I finally finished grieving my mom, you know? And so it was like everything before that was thinking, what is my dad going to think? He didn't care. I mean, he cared, but he didn't care. Right. Yeah, he was. Yeah, exactly. Like he, he didn't want that to dictate how you were acting. Like what, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And I don't yeah. want you to think that I don't love my mom. Of course I love my mom. And I'll get into of this course. a little bit later, but like, and I'll, I'll get into this later, but I can't control her, how she feels or how she reacts. I can just control how I feel and how I react and what I do and like moving forward. And I'll, I'll eventually tell you how I got to that realization. But again, now I'm just trying to make my mom happy. I do not want to disappoint her. And so I will keep talking to Triple B. I'll keep, you know, call him on Father's Day and things like that. So it's, it's crazy. So it, yeah, check in the boxes. So now I have to take the bar exam and... In New York, you have to take something called the character and fitness exam and in order to get admitted to the bar. So I took the bar exam, I passed the bar, but in order to get admitted, you have to take something called the character and fitness exam. That's where they do this huge background check on you. They take your fingerprints, they do like this FBI background check and they find anything wrong, you might not get admitted to the bar. And I was actually terrified of this all three years of law school because I wasn't sure if I was going to actually be able to become a lawyer. Because uh, of your history. Yeah. Exactly. So I rationalized to myself, you know what? You'll just have a JD, Kyle. Don't you won't even try to take your bar. And I wasn't even going to attempt to take the bar exam at all. But I was like, uh, after I graduated law school, I was like, you know, you've come this far. What what are they going to do? Take your law degree away from you? Like you already went through this far. Why not try to do this? So what I did was I flew back home to Ohio after living in New York, living in New York City, and I went to all of the courthouses and police stations, got certified copies of all of my police records. And submitted it to the character and fitness board to see if I get admitted to the bar. And so the way they do it in New York is you have to get interviewed by a prosecutor or, or a member of the bar to see. Everybody goes through it. So the day of my interview, I'm in there and there's you know dozens and dozens of law school graduates being interviewed. But they're only taking like two, five minutes. I'm in there for two hours waiting for someone to interview me. And I finally ask, what's going on? They go, oh, we're bringing in a special prosecutor for you. And so finally, Great. yeah, finally Great. this woman comes in and she has my file and Matt, there's like red tape coming out of it, you know, everything. And I'm like, here we go. This is like a worthless endeavor. And so finally we sit down and she starts going through this file and she goes quite the file here. And I go, yeah. 
And then she pulls out this piece of paper and I was like, what are we going to talk about? Are we going to talk about my fighting? Are we going to talk about like my underage drinking? What, what are we going to talk about? And she saw, oh, I see you got caught speeding in Michigan like while I was in law school. I was like, yeah. She goes, well, how do I know you're not going to do this going forward? And I'm thinking, this is what she's questioning me about. I go, well, I live in New York City and I don't even have a car. So it's impossible for me. She goes, oh, I guess you're right. She had like a little laugh about it. She goes through the rest of my file. It doesn't really ask me any more questions. She goes, are you going to be a good, you know, a good an ethical attorney? I was like, yes, ma'am. And that was it. Stamped. I was admitted to the bar. And I was like, a great weight was lifted off of my shoulders because I was- I bet. Really. And again, I thought that that would fix everything too. I thought, okay, so look, see- and another reason too- External validation. Yeah. And yeah. another reason too, I wasn't going to go through the character and fitness evaluation. I was so scared, not scared, worried that Triple B was like, yep, I told you you couldn't do this. And so I didn't want to hear him saying that. So that was a big part of the back of my head. But then then you also know that he's not going to care right. if you do. Eventually, but I'm still Which trying. Sucks. I'm still trying. Right. Though. I know. It's insane. Humans. <laughs> yeah. It's not insane. It's it's. I would venture to say it's probably normal. I think that if anyone has that experience, they think they could relate, but it's funny, not funny, just like it's not insane that, you know, we think, okay, well, it's going to validate him. But then we're also like, we know that even if it validates me, he's not going to validate it ever. Exactly. And like, it's a, it's like a, an endless trial that you're on for yourself to try to get this and no win. I would assume. Well, maybe there was. Yeah. But also like, I think part of that too is like, it started morphing into like, well, can you do it, Kyle? Can like, you know, starting to see if you're capable of it. Like, do I want to see if I can do this, you know, prove to myself that I'm, I'm worthy of it. Cause I didn't feel worthy of a lot of things. So I was trying to, you know, seek all these external validations to try and, you know, fix me and try to say I am worthy. And so a lot of it too started shifting towards I'm doing it for me to prove to myself, hey, I am, I'm worthy. Hey, world, look at me. I am good. So this is what I can do. Things like that. Yeah. But it's like that. I mean, it's like that law scale with the scale. What is it? The lady of justice with the. Yeah. yeah, that I'm thinking like, okay, well, is it, is, is Kyle thinking like he's trying to prove it to himself or is it really just this triple B that's just weighing everything down? Because as you tell your story, there's a lot of triumph. There's a ton of triumph as you talk about all the things that a lot of people probably wouldn't have been able to achieve that you did yet. And I can understand this as well. You seek the next stamp of approval. You seek the next, whatever it may be, like maybe one more thing will help. Right. One more thing. And then another thing, right. I did the same thing. I, exactly. I totally get that. And so, but when you tell your story, and I hope you see this now, I'm sure you do, lots of triumph, lots of oh, things absolutely. that society would have excluded you from had you, you know, like written you off, if you will, just like Triple B did, you know, and you did it. So I was also searching yeah, for the next thing, like I want to be good enough, I'm good enough. And eventually I realized it, Kyle wouldn't have mattered if you didn't even graduate high school. You know, you are good enough. You were good enough back then. And so it, it, it's a long, it takes a long time to get there though. But there was like, I still feel like early in that story, this still sounded like there was that fire in Kyle, like deeply buried, maybe like burning that you knew, you knew you could do it and you had faith in yourself. It's just sometimes we're conditioned to do the other things. Right. And I never had any, so that brings me to the next, I never really had anybody cultivate that spark. You know, it was just always myself. I was going So After I was admitted to the bar, I was like, well, you know what? I don't think I want to practice law. law. I'm open to it because I had such a bad experience of that internship. These guys were working like 80, 90 hours a week working in matrimonial law, and they hated every second of it. Yeah, they were like making all kinds of money, but all they cared about was like billable hours, and they were miserable. And I was looking at them. I was like, I don't know if I want to do this. I was getting panic attacks when I was working with them. It was terrible. I worked so hard to achieve all this, and this is what I end up with. Right. And so I started to apply to alternative legal careers where you need a law degree, but you're not actually practicing. And I got a job at a company at this uh, education company and the CEO and president is actually similar age to me and you. He actually kind of took me under his wing. This is the first time somebody like told me about like setting goals, you know, about meditating, about reading the right books and things like that. 
he really like blew my mind. And it was great because he was the same age as me and he's running like this multi-million dollar company. And he's like telling me, not he's not saying it out loud. He's like, you can do this too. You can do something with your life too. Here's how I did it. Here's how to do it. And I still that's what worked for me. And it was it was so life changing. It was similar to Mr. Brady, but now I was ready to hear it. And he was this guy, his name's David. He actually gave me the tools to do it. And so it was actually amazing. This is what I was craving for so bad. I was like starving for this. So I ate up everything he was telling me. And he really changed my life about, like I said, just setting goals about what I'm capable of, about pushing the boundaries, getting out of my comfort zone, everything, you name it. And it, it, it really altered the course of my life. And I feel, and I understand not everybody has that person in their life, or I understand how lucky I was to run into this. Like, and it, you worked your butt off to get there. So I agree. Maybe it was all predestined. <laughs> Maybe, but I'm so thankful for him and so thankful for him at that, at that moment. And so that was a huge thing that happened to me. And it was, it was amazing. And I was just like, I just dove in all the way. And also around this time too, I got into running and we can talk about running if you want, but running and ultra running became a huge part of my life. I'm a huge runner too, because I wasn't really a big exercise guy, but that was good to get like mental clarity and things like that. And so I was in New York City about five years and I was like, you know what, I'm done with, not not done with New York City, but I was like, it was time to move on. And so I moved back to Ohio and this is around 2013, 2014. And that's where I'm at today. And when I moved back, I started a similar business where I was working for with David and that kind of just kind of blew up a little bit, but enough where I was able to support myself. And it, it was, it was actually great. It gave me a lot of free time too. But also I knew that I learned from David was, you know, again, who you hang out with is going to dictate your future. So when I moved back to Ohio, I just started hanging out with all, all my running friends, like people who like to run, like people like to push themselves. People like to, you know, have a good life and a healthy life and a healthy lifestyle. So I just met these great friends that I'm still best friends with today. And I was hung out with them every day. And I went on adventures out West. I rent, I bought like a conversion van and I spent like six months out West, like traveling around, meeting a bunch of other people. And when I came back and this is like one of the biggest life shifts that happened to me. And when I came back from that trip, I was like, you know what? I want to write about my life. I want to write, tell my story to the people. And what I thought my story was going to be like, oh, you know, I spent six years in high school. I was a bad kid. You know, I was bad. And I, I, over, I overcame this, overcame this. And then as I was started writing, I was like, well, let's start at the beginning, Kyle. What is your first memory of your life? And I'm trying to think about my first memory. And it was when I was four years old, when I met Triple B. That was my first memory that I ever had. So I started writing this and, and I started just, you know, crying. And I just started writing about how I grew up. And I wasn't even planning on writing any of this stuff. But this was the first time that I realized how I grew up and like how bad it was and how serious it was and why the reasons why I became who I was. And it was really like hard at that moment, but it was amazing because now I know what happened and now I can do something about it. Now I can change the narrative. I can change what's going on. Now I was like, oh, you happened to, you know, you can, you know, seek therapy. You can talk to people. Now you know why you act these way, this way. Now you know why you tried to find those kind of friends you know, like, that weren't good for you. And you know, you're trying to prove something, but it was actually life altering. That was one of the biggest things that ever happened. I started writing this because I, you, if you would have told me 10 minutes before I started writing, it was like, oh, were you, you know, abused as a kid? I was like, no, my stepdad was just a jerk. You know what I mean? I would have said like, that's what I would have said. But after this, it was crazy. And it just, opened up a lot of things for me that obviously I had to work through, but it was just, yeah, you probably got messy for a little bit. Oh, for sure. And I'm still, you know, working on it too. I'm not like, a pro, yeah. you know, but it was, you're not, <laughs> well, no. you know, <laughs> I'm sure that's what, I, <laughs> that's what's coming right, up. Exactly. It's like, just perfect. Yeah. No, I, I, I think it's, I think a lot, that was what happened to me in therapy was a very similar experience because I was like, I was going to therapy for like work just was like really crappy at the time. And then I started like emptying my story to her. And she's like, you realize that all the decisions that you've made since, since your mom died, you were making with that eight year old in mind, like the fear of that eight year old. And it was like, you said like the clouds parted and like, Oh, 
And then I was able to like connect all these dots of like all the things and decisions and poor decisions and things that I made over the years. And it just like comes and then you're like, what do I do with all this? So I'm sure like, as you're writing this on paper, you're like, like, really? Like, did this really like, could this be true? Right. Did you have any of those moments where you're like, this feels like it's a movie, not a Kyle's life? Well, I, so after I wrote it all down, I was like, well, am I the only way it feels this way? So my brother, and my sister experienced, like grew up in the same household. Mm. So what I did before I published it, I shared it with them and they read the whole thing and they were like, it was eye opening to them too. Cause they never, cause remember my mom said, this is your dad. This is love. This, and so we were all playing along this whole time. And once I shared it to them, they're like, Oh my God, yes, this is exactly what happened. Like, this is what, you know, our life was like, like, thank you. No, not like, thank you for like bringing this up, but like it helped them heal as well too. And way to move forward. It was, it, it was really, did they face any similar challenges? Not that you have to give away their secrets, but did they face any like, not as bad similar as challenges? T- yeah. So it was just, you absorbed more of it probably. I don't, I, I, maybe my brother like absorbed the meanness of him more than I did. I, I think I took it worse, but I don't know. Because you were younger. You didn't have any memories before that. Right. And I just felt alone. If that's alone. your first lasting memory. Right. Eek. And so, yeah, when I told my brother that story, he said he had no idea that that was your first memory, you know? And so, but it was good to get validation that I'm not crazy, <laughs> that I'm not making this, you know what I mean? And they were like, yeah, this mm-hmm. is exactly what happened. Right. Yeah. No, I could imagine if you told other people, they'd be like, that's, you're, you're just you know, you're embellishing that or, you know, this, that, or the other, or you had control all along. You're like, really? I was four, right. you know, exactly. and that's deeply embedded. Those feelings and those things that happen around that time, you're, I can, I mean, your story makes sense to me. I think there are people that it would not make sense. Like, and, and it wouldn't be validated because they wouldn't be like, they'd be like, no, you could just, you can just change on your own. You can just stop doing that, Kyle. And you're like, I really wanted to, but that was just the way my life was turning out. It was just, I got myself into these situations. I didn't want to, but I did. And that's how it happened. And, you know, like so many triumphs, like I said before, but I can imagine what that, what that book, was it scary putting that book into the world? For sure. Because it's one thing to write it down and share it with your family, right? Right, for sure. Well, because I, right when I published it, I shared it with my mom and that did not go over well. Mm. Cause she's, did she tell you you were wrong or was no, she, just, she was like, well, you know what she hung on, hangs on to. It's like, well, there were good parts of your childhood, right? Like that's what she, that's what she hangs on to. And like, that's what she like, she goes, you know, I love you. And I do, I don't want, I don't, again, I don't want my listeners to think I don't love my mom. I do love my mom, but like she grew up like at a different, different life. And it's just, she wants to pretend and I can't, I can't control the way, you know, she's going to heal. Like I, I want her to be happy. Of course I do, but I need to focus in order for me to help her out. I need to heal myself and focus on me. And if I didn't focus on me, then I would just be unhappy too, to my detriment. And then she would still be unhappy too. So what? And so I just need to focus on me healing and I can't change anybody else. I just focus on what I can control and move forward. Well, you experienced that as well. No one could change you either until you were truly ready to grab that toolbox that David gave you, you know, you heard what Mr. Brady said, probably sat with you a little bit. It, you move forward, but you weren't ready until you were handed the tools on how it would work for you. And the tools that were given you were that you were given probably don't work for everybody, right? Like you have to be ready and in the right place, right time. The universe was conspiring for you to you know, come across David and and learn these things from him and see someone successful that's a similar age, that you're like, oh, I could probably do that too. Like I could try these things and you were ready to do it at that time. Right. Do you see it as that? Or do you think if you met David when you were 18, you would have no, it, taken those on? No, it was the right time. Absolutely. I was ready. I was craving it. It's like, what, uh, I forget what that saying is. The teacher will show up when the student's ready or what, whatever. <laughs> I don't know if I ever quoted that until today, but hey, I guess know. that's what happened. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true. I think from my own experience, I feel like until I'm fully aware of what I need, I won't accept any pieces. You know, like I have to be ready for therapy. I have to be ready for whatever for it to work for me. If someone had forced me at 22 into therapy because like you had to go or court ordered or something, I don't think, I don't think it would have worked because I would have been 
I don't need this. What are you talking about? I'm fine. You know, until I was like, oh, I'm not fine. Right. And then it was like, then it worked. Right. And to answer your question, it was, it, it still is scary putting the story out there, but I think oh, it's yeah. pretty important. That question. <laughs> but I think it's pretty important because it's selfishly, it's very healing for me. And also sharing my story, like I hear back from other people, it's like, oh my gosh, like this is, you know, similar to kind of what my story is. And also I, I always had this excuse in the back of my head, like, no, you guys don't understand my, my story's different. You know what I mean? There's no healing or coming back from that or shifting from that. Like my story's different, but like, yes, everyone's story is different, but I never thought I'd be able to be where I'm at today. Like, you know, years ago. Cause I always thought in my head, like, oh no, my story's just too messed up. And like, too, like my mom's still with this guy. So th that's excuse you guys wouldn't understand. You know what I mean? And so I don't know where I'm going with this, but what I'm saying is, it's just, there's, I stopped with the excuses, I guess. And just, and I knew there's something inside me that I wanted to put this story out there. And I'm just very glad that I did. And it still is scary today. So, you know, people say, oh, once you put your story out there, it's everything's, you know, rainbows and shine. It's not, you know, I'm still healing. I'm still moving through this and it's just, I'm trying to do my best. But it's out of you. Right. I think that's a, that's a big healing piece. You're not keeping it all inside anymore, which is, really tiring and really, you know, like, and so just letting it out. I, I, sometimes I talk to people and I'm like, you know, sometimes I manifest these things in my head and they seem so scary. And then I say them out loud to someone. And I'm like, oh, that's not that bad. Like it feels like more power. And I would assume that putting your story to paper and then publishing it for the world to read, if they choose to, can be that fairly similar. Like it just gets it out of you. And now you can move forward with what you have created for yourself. Yeah. And, and as like, my hope is like, it just heals some other people or hopefully it helps other people too. So that was the main reason. Are you finding that? Are you finding that people that have read it are saying, you know, I, I dealt with something similar or, you know, and then does that help, help you heal more to realize you aren't the only one that's gone through something so terrible? in your experience. Yeah. It, well, it reinforces that I did the right thing, putting it out there and I'm glad it's helping other people. But now I know, I mean, I think I'm mature enough and I know that other people have gone through these similar things. And, and I think it's good too. Like we're so scared to like talk about these things, but we got to shine a light on like all this kind of stuff. Like even these bad things that we might be embarrassed or ashamed about, like we got to shine a light on it. It won't be, and then it won't hurt so bad. It won't have this power over us because this had a power over me for so you know, for so long. And then I was just like, I'm sick of it. But like, you know, now it's out here. And like, now I'm just shining a light on it. It's like, you can't hurt me like the way you have been hurting or keeping me back the way you have been keeping me back. Yeah. No, there's power in, in normalizing some of these feelings that we have, because we are humans and we have all these feelings and you probably have had all of them, sadness, shame, anger, all the pieces that happiness, all the pieces that come with you. But, but our generation growing up, we were we were really, as guys, we were told, like, you can show anger, which you did. You can show uh, you know, happiness if you want to. Happiness and anger. You weren't allowed to show people that you were sad. You weren't allowed to show people that things weren't, that you didn't have things under control, right? Like, I feel like we were just taught to be, like, angry or happy. Right, exactly. Don't do anything else. But now that if we're, like, like Kyle, I'm having a terrible day today, and that's okay. You know, like I'll figure it out. I'm going to work through it, but I'm acknowledging it and putting it out loud and normalizing the fact that like we can feel however we need to feel because we're full humans, I guess. And I've gotten a lot of the tools. Like what's helped me out too is like obviously writing, but now like, you know, journaling, I don't know if you practice with journaling, but like journaling helps so much because you just see patterns in there. And it's good to get all your thoughts out at the beginning of the day. And so that's helped me out a lot too. What makes you feel most like human these days? Most human? Well, like running makes me feel most human. That's where I feel most alive, just running out there. I don't, I don't listen to like music or anything like that. And usually I'm with my friends, but when I'm out by myself running in the middle of the woods or something like that, that's where I feel the most. Cause then I can see, you know, how far you're, what, what you're capable of doing is just you in the outside world. So that's what I love doing the most is. Is that like a, a thought cleansing absolutely. experience for you too? Do you process thoughts or are you kind of erase and just run and do your thing. I, I think it's more of a processing the thoughts, you know, just okay. going through things and just, you know, going through life. And it's like journaling without 
like but exactly you're running yep exactly in a way mm-hmm. yeah it's just very, very no i mean that makes sense meditative but you were running your whole life right no i just technically i just started running no but like metaphorically oh, there you go exactly yes i you was know, and like and now you're running with purpose now you're running because you choose to to see how far you can go whereas your whole life you were running from triple b and or running you know like to the next thing that maybe can make everyone love you maybe can impress everyone maybe can show everyone that they were wrong and now you're like now i'm gonna just run because it helps me well i think so just to put in a little another metaphor i think i was running away from myself as opposed to i think i just turned around and started running towards myself inside myself and so i think that's a big thing that i that i did that little fire that i was like you had some kind of fire it's like now you're like running to light it up even more well that's that's cool yeah that's the you know the title of my book is wondering spark and that's kind of like why i wrote like had that title because I had that little spark inside me. It could have gone either way though. Like it could have, I could have blew myself up, but it was a spark inside me that, you know, flourished and blossomed. I, yeah. Just for full disclosure to everyone listening, I choose not to know too much about the people that I, I speak to on the podcast. So I'm not like a jerk. I just don't want to know too much because I really want these conversations to unfold in the way that they have. So I think it's interesting that I kind of saw that and, and now that's your title. No, so. I appreciate it. Actually, that I, yeah. reinforces that it was a good title for me. So, yeah, it's the thing about your story is that although unique to you, it's probably unfortunately not unique to a lot of people in a similar, you know, the way that they felt growing up and the way that that affected them as they tried to go through each stage of life, if you will. But you did the right thing, in my opinion, by putting it out there for the world to see so that other people can see, oh, he went through all this, but look what he's doing now. Look what he did for himself. Look how he turned this around. Maybe I can take one of those tools from his toolkit and try it in my own world to like make my life feel the way that feels most human, if we will. You know, maybe it's not running, maybe it's not journaling, but maybe it's something that they read that you, that you, that you also do and they choose to do that. So I think, I think you've made that terrible situation into something that can be really valuable for other people, not just yourself. Right. Thank you. So, yeah, no, I think it's, it's it's a similar vein to, I know you said like something about it was like somewhat selfish because it was healing in, in a, in a way for me, this podcast is somewhat selfish as well, because every conversation I have has this little element of healing that eight year old version of me that just felt like he was the only kid. And so it's just, such a valuable experience and so relatable in a terrible way because humans shouldn't have to go through all these things that we go through. But I guess that's part of the journey that each of us has right. on this earth. And I think us being like being uh, in service to others, you know, I'm sure in the book you're doing the podcast. I think that's really helpful too. like selfishly it's fulfilling, but also being in service, you're just trying to help out as much as you can. And I think the more that we do it, like we, we discovered this decades into our journeys, right? But I think the more that we can do it, maybe the younger generations can pick that up early on, you know, and then they don't have to wait till they're in their thirties and forties to kind of really manifest the change that they want to see in themselves, but also in the people around them. So I think by what we're doing, I see that as the hope that comes from it. That's my hope as well. Yeah. So if people want to read your book and stuff. How do, how do we get that? How do we figure that out? So my book is, uh, it's on Amazon and Barnes and Noble, uh, wandering spark is the title of it. And then all my social medias is Kyle V Robinson on all my social medias on everything. Awesome. Find me, say hi. Well, yeah, definitely connect with, with Kyle before I let you go. I do want to ask you a question and I'm trying to think of who, if this version of Kyle could go back to the version of Kyle that's sitting in that in school suspension and just like, how do I, I gotta be good and I have to make it through. And I, how do I figure that? Is there anything that you would want to tell him? Well, so it's funny you say that I actually have talked to him before and I do, you know, through therapy, I, I don't know if you're familiar with IFS therapy, internal family systems, where I do go back and I do talk to him. I have told him that, you know, I just tell him that I am here for you. Somebody is here for you. And I, I talk to that four-year-old more often, you know, telling him that I am here for you. You are worthy. And like, you are loved. Cause I didn't, I didn't feel loved for a large, long portion of my life. And so I talk to them often 
to be honest with you. And I let them know that I'm here for you. So just knowing that, you know, they're still part of me and they're just like, and just knowing that they have somebody because growing up, I felt like I didn't have anybody. Like I felt like no one was there for me. And so I, I didn't know that at the time. I didn't know what I was looking for. And so it's nice to tell them that I am there for them. And, you know, I'm an adult now and you're going to be okay. And that I love you. That is probably what they, what that version of you needed to hear because you were told what love was, but you weren't shown in a, in a way that maybe you understand now as an adult and the self-love and those pieces that come along with it. Yeah, it's, it's so interesting. I think more people that I talk to too are doing what you do and, and have those conversations with those people. So I'm glad that you're doing that and you regularly do it. I think it's such a healthy practice that probably the 18 year old version of you would not think was anything real, you know, Correct. I think we would be like, what, what are you talking about? Why would you do that? But it's, it's just such a valuable experience. So thank you for sharing your story in this way, in the way that you do. And I look forward to reading your book and reading in between all the, the pieces that you probably had to skip over for this podcast. It's, it's really an important thing you're doing. So thank you for that. No, man, I appreciate you. Let me share my story and thank you so much. And you're doing a great, great service here on your podcast. So thank you. Well, I appreciate that. I will accept that. If you heard Kyle's story today and you know someone in your life that might benefit from hearing his story, we would love it if you would share this episode with them. That would be super valuable. If it helped you reach out to Kyle, tell him tell him so. Tell him that you related to something that he said. I think he will also enjoy that. And with that, I'm going to say goodbye. And I will be back next week with a brand new episode of the Life Shift Podcast. Thanks again, Kyle. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. For more information, please visit www.thelifeshiftpodcast.com.